Yes, welcome everyone who's joining us. We are, we just decided to wait some more minutes, like one or two, and then start as we have like 51 participants. We have 15 at the moment, maybe one or the other is still joining us. So um, yes, great, you are all here. And um, we'll start in about a minute. Okay, it's three minutes past, I think we'll start. Welcome everyone to this Gen public webinar, how to foster shared decision-making through guidelines. I hope you all are aware that this session is being recorded and will be available on YouTube, I think tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. So um, if everyone and anyone has problems with that, um, you either turn on, out your microphone and delete your name or um, just leave the webinar. But if not, you're all welcome to share some thoughts on shared decision-making and how to implement this into guideline protection with me. Yes, um, I think we are not so many um, as have registered. Um, so we are a rather small group, so we can do a lot of discussion, which is great. And um, let's start. Um, first of all, my conflicts of interest. I have no financial conflicts of interest. I do not get paid for anything I'm talking about. However, I am and have been involved in guideline development processes that have focused on encouraging shared decision-making through guidelines. And I am responsible for the German National Disease Management Guidelines Program, where we definitely try to implement as many decision aids into guidelines as possible. So I definitely do think that combining shared decision-making and guidelines is a good thing. And this is a kind of um, intellectual conflict of interest. Yes. Um, what do I want to do with you today? This is the agenda. We are um, like 22 people right now. So we have time for a little introduction, a personal introduction. Then I'll give you a short presentation on strategies, how to incorporate aspects of shared decision-making into guideline development. And then I will definitely want to discuss with you how to move forward, how to enhance these strategies and how to encourage the update, uh, the, the, the uptake of these strategies and guideline uh, development. And I want to do a short wrap up with you to discuss the next steps that could be a kind of task for Gen Public. So what do you want Gen Public to do to support you or other guideline developers you're aware of? in order to strengthen shared decision-making aspects in guidelines. Um, okay, I think I stop the presentation right now for a little while and ask you for some personal introduction. We're not so many people, so um, welcome to you all. And it would be great if you could turn your mics and your cameras on while introducing yourself, answering the just two questions. The one is, to what extent are you involved in guideline development and or shared decision making? And second, do you think that guidelines are a barrier to shared decision making? I would like you to start in the way I see you at the on, on my screen. So this is Nicholas the first. <laughs> Welcome, Nicholas. You want to say a few words about you? In case you don't hear me, next one is Jakob. Jakob Mazalik, I hope you're, yes, you turn your microphone on, that's great. Hi, welcome. 
Marzal, I'm a project manager for clinical practice guidelines with the American Psychological Association. And um, the two, uh, I'm sorry, with the th two questions were uh, the shared decision making and enabling, and, and if there were any barriers, was that correct? If you think that guidelines are a barrier to shared decision making, if you think that I, is uh, or a contradiction I, or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't think I'd see them as a bear. I could see them as a, a very good tool to help facilitate the shared decision making. And I, I'm thinking it depends on how the guidelines are laid out. You know, I think they're laid out in a, um, a friendly way where the clinician can pull it off their bookshelf as quick quickly as possible and look it through and then develop different strategies such as algorithms, you know, and have right. a tutorial um, sense of how to apply the guideline uh, within the shared decision making with the patient. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Tatiana, you already posted something. You want to comment on my question? If you think guidelines are a barrier to shared decision making? Or you don't have the microphone on? Yes. Tatiana, looks like you don't have your microphone on, but you post, okay, you just posted that, thank you. Next one is, you think that evidence-based guidelines are essential to shared decision-making, thank you. Maria, next one I see on the screen. Are you involved with guideline development and or shared decision-making? And do you think guidelines are a barrier to shared decision-making? Maria? Okay, then next one is, okay, your guideline. Thank you for posting it. You can all, next one is Dominic. Yes, looks like your mic is open. Yes, hello, I'm Dominic Springers, working at the Dutch uh, uh, Patient Advocacy Organization. Um, I'm involved uh, to um, shared decision making, not especially uh, involved, uh, involved to um, shared decision making in guidelines. Uh, but I can't imagine uh, guideline, guidelines are uh, a barrier for shared decision making. You can't, okay. No. <laughs> Great. So you <laughs> all have a very positive uh, vision of guidelines. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Thank you. And soon, you're the next. And soon, Chin, are you able? Do you understand? Yes, hi. Yes, hi. Yes, could you just shortly introduce you yourself? Me? Wait. Sorry? Can you hear me or? Yes, we can hear you. That's oh, great. Yeah. I am a kind of guideline developer in Korea. And just I'm interested about this shared decision making through the guideline development process. And so uh, I never experienced this kind of thing, but just tonight I would like to learn how to approach through the guideline development process. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Einstein. Great. Next one is Oliana. Oliana, you want to introduce yourself? If that's possible. If not, I'll move on to Johannes. Mary, and thank you for posting. Okay, so I'll, I'll just try. Next one is Leonardo, and who is not able to open his mic, just is invited to post it in the chat as some did. Hi, Leonardo, thank you. Um, you're without microphone, that's great. Esther, next one. Also. Hi. I'm Esther Rake uh, from the Netherlands. I work at the Knowledge Institute uh, of Medical Specialists. 
So I did a lot of guideline development and I'm currently focusing on shared decision making and patient decision aids. And I feel that uh, uh, the way we um, define the recommendations is a barrier for shared decision making. Right, thank you for this view. <laughs> Very helpful. Um, next one is Lindsay. Hello, my name is Lindsay. I'm from the USA. I'm a guideline developer for the American Academy of Dermatology. Ideally, I like to say that guidelines should um, facilitate shared decision making. However, I agree with Esther's sentiment that the way we frame things like strong recommendations, for example, might serve as a barrier to a shared discussion about um, whether or not an intervention is appropriate. Perfect. Thank you. Next is Rachel. Hi, everyone. I'm Raquel Halfond. I'm with the American Psychological Association, um, Senior Director for Evidence-Based Practice and Health Equity, and I oversee guideline development, clinical practice guideline development for APA. And I see clinical practice guidelines as a tool to be used as part of shared decision making. Great. Thank you. Sandy, great to have you here. Hi, it's, it's great to be here. So um, I have, uh, well, let's start the video too, it, if it works. Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I run the um, Guideline Consulting and Systematic Review Organization, EBQ Consulting. We have a lot of guideline developing clients, and I feel that it's our, our role, our job to help make the guidelines more user-friendly for patients and every stakeholder to be able to understand not only what we did to get to the point where we came up with the recommendations we did, but how to understand what it means so that when you're engaging in, hopefully engaging in shared decision-making, you understand it in context. So for example, if um, it is a strong recommendation, then theoretically, it's a recommendation where everybody would choose that intervention because it um, is um, in sync with patient values and preferences, and the evidence is very strong, and it's clearly the right choice and so forth. Of course, we don't have too many of those recommendations usually. And so the reality is we have to explain how to understand other recommendations in the context in which they live and what they're based on and what are the strengths and weaknesses associated with each one and how to interpret that and how to think about it in your individual context. So one of my... Um, uh, one thing that I strive for that I hope someday we will get there is, is true precision medicine, where instead of talking about guideline recommendations for populations of patients, we'll be talking about guidelines for individual patients. And we'll be able to look very specifically at the unique situation of each person. So it would be, you know, what are their... Um, not just values and preferences, but also what are their um, other, you know, conditions they're dealing with, other symptoms, other um, contraindications to medicines they may be taking and so forth for other things and try to really find a balance and look at not what works for a population of patients, but what will work for this patient. And mm -hmm. then I think we will truly attain a quality shared decision-making approach, but we're trying to get as close as we can to that ideal now. Thank you, Sandy. Very, very important um, idea that you just um, formulated. Okay, next one is Diana. Hello, good afternoon. Am I very clearly? Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, I'm Diana from the Philippines. I work in our Department of Health, and my role in guideline development is indirect, wherein I'm part of the team that appraises the guidelines that our medical societies and other members from the academe produce uh, for, for us to translate it in, into our policies and laws that affect uh, the service delivery 
for that our uh, the Department of Health uh, does to to deliver to our population. And uh, but my direct role is to, uh, as I said, uh, to translate the the recommendations of the guidelines into the policies that we are enacting. And as for the other question, if uh, shared decision making is a facilitator, I would see that it is a facilitator uh, because, because uh, as we translate the guidelines into the policies, we see that shared decision making is an important step in their development. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Mary, you posted um, something in the chat, and the, I think the most important thing that you said was that guidelines can be both a barrier and a facilitator for shared decision making. And um, both of you, you mentioned also examples for, for, for both um, aspects, and I think that's very important. We, can, we will go uh, deeper into that. Um, thank you. Next one is Greg. Greg Traversi, if I read that right. Either you post something in the chat or you just turn up the mic and introduce yourself. And if that's not possible, I move on to Kate. Hi, uh, Kate Wiki with the American Academy of Dermatology. Um, I would agree with what everyone has said um, overall, just that Guidelines are uh, at their best. I think the intention is to use them as a tool for shared decision making, um, but I could definitely see them as a barrier as well in that process. Thank you. Next is Sharniel. Hi, I'm Sharniel McDaniels. I'm the librarian attached to the guidelines team at the American Academy of Dermatology. Um, I think creating a guideline um, is an exercise in shared decision making. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> That's right. I think at the um, clinical level, it should be a place to um, support an integrated team in decision making. Thank you. Next is Lauren. I think I saw you on our last workshop at the June conference. Is that right? Yes, hello. Um, it's great to see everyone. My name is Lauren Zyke. I am responsible for guidelines at the American Society of Plastic Surgeons. Um, my thoughts are all over the place, so I'll just apologize for that in advance. Um, but in general, um, we are trying to reconsider how we are going to incorporate shared decision-making products into our guideline process. So many of our recommendations end up being you know, intervention A is comparable to intervention B, types of, of um, equivalencies. So, and then we just say that and walk away. Um, and I'm really trying to push the organization towards providing shared decision-making tools so that instead of just saying, well, you can do this procedure or that procedure, we have some more support for that kind of conversation and that shared decision-making process. Um, I think the really there's two big challenges that we're confronting that, that may or may not speak to other people, but one is that our guidelines are very much directed at clinicians. They are not patient facing the way guidelines are in some other organizations. And so that um, certainly presents limitations for shared decision making. I mean, I think people have been talking about that. But the other big thing that has really been a challenge for us to figure out is something that I think Sandy was talking about, which is essentially that um, guidelines don't necessarily yet have a really clear way of handling patient risk factors. Um, so when you get to that shared decision-making conversation, you really need to have a robust, um, a robust set of data, really a systematic review on the, the impacts of all of these different risk factors so that those can be brought into those shared decision-making conversations. Um, and we're trying to figure out how we um, with the resources we have, um, are, are able to do both things, to do a guideline that's clinician facing, but then provide kind of that additional support um, for the, the shared decision-making conversation so that we can address some of those risk factors and what things would lead to one intervention versus another um, for an individual patient. Thank you, Lauren. Very important aspect as well. Um, 
Next one is Josine. If I spell it right? Yes. Hi. Uh, yes, Josine. Uh, I'm uh, from the Dutch Patient Federation. I'm a colleague of uh, Dominique. Uh, and I'm, I'm not directly involved with guidelines. My colleagues uh, are, but I am uh, involved a lot with your decision making. And mm -hmm. I think guidelines, uh, they don't have to be a barrier, uh, but they can be uh, depending on how, uh, how the recommendations are formulated. So I think I think we have examples of, of both where it helps and also where it's a barrier. Yes, thank you. Um, next one is Janice. Janice, if your mic also doesn't work, you can also post something in the chat. And I think I will move on to Safia. Hello, uh, I'm a guideline developer in Belgium uh, for primary care. Um, I've never been involved in the share making decision development tool, but I, I found it very important and the uh, guideline should, shouldn't be uh, an obstacle to use share decision making. and. Uh, so yes, I uh, would like to go further to know how to make the links between uh, development of guideline and shared decision making tool. Thank you. And thank you, Greg, for posting something. Um, you said that your decision making is a very important element of guidelines, particularly in the case of conditional or weak recommendations. And sometimes hard to communicate. Yes, that's definitely an issue. And um, thank you everyone for sharing your first experience and your first thoughts on um, the issue. I would like to continue now with the presentation and give a very short um, presentation on the toolkit chapter where this um, um, workshop is based upon. Um, it is the um, chapter that has been issued last year on shared decision-making and guidelines. That's what it looks like. Um, I did this chapter together with Andy Hutchinson from NICE. He was responsible for the development of the NICE guideline on shared decision-making. And we had some acknowledgements from and important um, comments from, from uh, very kind colleagues from, uh, from Spain, from the Netherlands and from the UK and Scotland. Um, Scotland is UK, sorry. <laughs> So England and Scotland, yeah. Okay, um, and there we list some strategies that might enable shared decision-making through guidelines. Um, and these strategies have been first like discovered in a kind of workshop with um, guideline experts, and they have been explored further in different guideline communities. And what we, what we come up with in this chapter is kind of summary of the research that has been done so far. So one very simple thing is to use a wording that supports discussion between the patient or the service user and health or social care professional about their care. So not being directive in the sense of doing something, but definitely encourage discussion. I'll show you an example for that. Next one is presentation of options and the harms and benefits in a way that enables risk communication and discussion, discussion of options. That's like more... Um, um, offering the chance to to compare options to each other, even to the to the healthcare professional. So, like um, in the way it is presented in the guideline. Um, next one is the systematic identification and prioritization of recommendations and clinical situations that are most relevant to your decision making. I think this is an issue that would um, need some further investigation because. Somehow we all have a kind of idea what kind of situation might call for shared decision making, but we can easily forget this throughout the whole guideline development because we have so many tasks and so many things to do that once we have a systematic tool, how to um, identify this kind of recommendations, we, we know it is a further step in guideline development that we would have to at least have a look at before uh, publishing the guidelines. So this kind of systematic identification would definitely be helpful. Um, 
You could provide a generic chapter or guideline on shared decision-making to highlight its importance. I'll give an example for this as well. And you can provide guideline-based decision tools that has been mentioned already by some of your um, some of the participants in their introduction. So um, yes, um, offering guideline-based decision aids or um, short tools for supporting decision making. And this most important one, I think, is integrating aspects of shared decision making and decision aids into the guideline, into the recommendations and algorithms. So these are the most important strategies that we have identified. And I'll give you some short examples of what we exactly mean by that. So this is a very simple example. Use a wording that encourages discussion and option talk as like an example. We, we recommend all patients with cardiovascular disease receive statins. And this is that kind of strong recommendation, Sandy, that you mentioned. I think the evidence is very clear that it provides benefit. However, um, it's not. It's a kind of prognostic benefit, and we're not very sure that everyone taking statins will, will have this benefit. However, I think most guidelines will come up with a strong recommendation for that one. And you can change the wording in saying, we recommend, and this is still the strong recommendation, we recommend statins be offered to all patients with cardiovascular disease. And in this um, idea of um, saying you offer something, um, you encourage discussion and um, discuss the offer with a patient. Um, so this is the first and quite simple thing to do is just change the wording of recommendations. And I think someone of you mentioned that before, that uh, the way recommend recommendations are presented sometimes might be a barrier. So if you use a kindly a wording and a wording that encourages discussion, um, that might be helpful. Next one is the presentation of all options in a way that enables option talk. And I give you an example of our guidelines on diabetes. And you, here you see just like six fully written pages of information on, on diabetes medication and the alternatives that there are with all the harms and benefits and the evidence and everything that there is. Quite hard to read stuff even for the clinicians. And you can also present it in a way like that, which is very simple. Sorry, it is in German, but we have German guidelines. You, you see here the, the all, all the medications that there are. You, you see here mortality. Here are um, uh, follow-up consequences on like the diabetes-related re um, events, um, hypoglycemia, effect on um, weight and um, um, HbA1c and this is a very, very simple structure, and it allows you to compare a very complex bunch of medications because it's not it's not a real first choice for some situations. For some there is, for others there, there isn't. So that was a first idea to um, to um, let's say break down a a um, very complex. Um, phenomenon like diabetes medication to a very simple table. Sometimes simplification isn't that simple and that easy. And as Sandy said, it's very important to have the personal information behind that. But that was just a first step, saying we offer the, the, medic, the, the information in a way that enables you to compare the options. Next thing is generic chapters or guidelines on shared decision-making. This is the NICE guideline that I have mentioned was published last year in, in, in June. And I think that was quite a big issue because it, there was definitely a raising awareness of shared decision making. And specifically with that guideline, it was a large focus on the infrastructure that it is needed to support shared decision making in all the healthcare facilities. And they had a very strong focus on the um, the um, responsibility of the, um, let's say, of, of, of the medical leaders, of, of um, the management and everything. So um, people definitely have to be committed to the idea that shared decision-making matters. So that was, I think that was something important. Um, it's also about providing advice on how to implement shared decision-making into practice. Um, it's not referring to a specific condition. So you, you can use it for different um, situations. You can do the same with generic chapters that you insert into a guideline. Um, 
Next one is the provision of uh, guideline-based decision tools, that what I said about um, decision aids. You can produce and provide these decision tools based on the guideline and the underlying body of evidence. This is very important that it is definitely consistent with, with the work you do for the guideline. Um, we think it is important that it is improved by the guideline panel. It's not that you pre produce it um, parallelly to the guideline, but together with the guideline team so that everyone is definitely sure what you say in the decision aid is consistent with the guideline. Um, it can be produced and provided either after guideline publication or parallelly. That depends on the resources that guideline de developers have. If you have a team that is um, experienced in producing patient information material and in medical writing, um, that is very helpful. And then you can do, produce it parallelly and you publish everything together. Um, and you can it, it can be produced either by the guideline group or by an external team of information specialists, which requires more communication, but however, ensures that you have the expertise that you need if it's not in the guideline group. It is important that um, decision aids develop for guidelines adhere to international quality standards, like the IPTAS instrument. And with some um, tools that are used for guideline development, you can at least produce semi-automatic um, decision support tools like with Great Pro or Magic, but these are not really decision aids, but what they offer is the visualization of harms and benefits of interventions. So what is lacking here is the, the importance of the questions that might matter besides the harms and benefit of the intervention that might also guide decision making. Um, and last but not least, there's the integration of shared decision-making into the guideline and its algorithms. And I've here an example from a German guideline on cardiovascular and, and, and um, artery disease, uh, coronary heart disease, sorry. And um, it's here you see the algorithm on revascularization. And what I've highlighted in magenta are the um, three um, situations in which we recommend the use of a decision aid and we have integrated this into the algorithm. So before invasive diagnostics, you have to learn about the, the use of prognostic procedures for revascularization. And if you decide not to do any of these, you don't need invasive diagnostics. Then if you decide for angiography, Next one in this algorithm says, either you decide whether or not you receive a PCI that is stenting right uh, during this procedure or whether you decide to wait if you don't see any indication for a bypass surgery, which would be the first goal for angiography. And the last one is when you have a multivessel disease and you have an indication for revascularization, you, you offer the decision aid um, comparing um, bypass versus stents. So, and this is in the algorithm, and it's not only in the algorithm, but we have also developed decision aids that are provided with this guideline. This is the online, and this is the um, PDF document, and it's um, in the format of option grids, which is an evaluated format, and it's easy to hand out. It definitely sums up the most important questions, and it's on one page, and you can go through it together when talking to each other. So these kind of um, consultation decision aids are those where I think most specialists think that these are the ones that enable shared decision-making best. So these are some examples that of how you could use the different strategies that we have suggested in our chapter. And here you see a very simple table with an overview of these strategies. And we have like grouped them according on how resource demanding they are. And the most easiest, uh, the easiest thing is um, uh, to revise the wording of a recommendation. Um, it's not at all resource demanding, it's just thinking about the wording that you use. The presentation of options and their benefit and harm profile in the guideline in an understandable way um, is not that important because you have to, you have to do the work in, in either way, either it's understandable or not. So um, it's a little bit more resource demanding because you have to think about how you do it, but however, that's not so difficult. But when it comes to like the systematic identification 
of shared decision-making situations, you have to do a different step and another step, an additional step in guideline development, which is resource demanding. Um, if you provide a generic chapter on shared decision-making or develop a guideline on shared decision-making, this is definitely something that demands further resources. The provision of guideline-based decision support tools is uh, resource demanding because you need external um, expertise for the guideline group. And the integration of shared decision-making and decision aids into the guideline as well. So this is a very short um, introduction on the strategies that we suggest. And um, what I would like to discuss with you right now is are the following questions, is how do you think we can encourage guideline developers to include aspects of shared decision-making and which ones do you think are promising? And this was um, um, the second question comes from Carol P. Keithley, who is a patient representative on our gin public group. She was very keen on asking, how do we create the right, the right mindset? It's not only offering tools, but it's a kind of commitment to an idea of shared decision making. How, so how can that be done? Let's start with these two questions. How do we encourage guidelines to include aspects of shared decision making? And how do we create the right mindset? Who has ideas and suggestions? You just turn up on, on your microphone and speak up. You can raise your hand. Then I see that you have a contribution to make. However, um, I don't know what your experiences are. We have seen in Germany that there are only a few guidelines who definitely have tried to um, to um, implement one or the other strategy to encourage shared decision making, but it's a very small minority. And Lauren, you just turned off your camera. What's your what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I not maybe exactly what you asked. I think mostly I was just going to share kind of what I am seeing as our really big obstacle, which is that our guideline questions are not the questions that our patients need the shared decision-making support for. So for example, um, we are working on breast reconstruction after cancer um, and our patient representatives really wanna do shared decision-making products on financial toxicity of different breast reconstruction options um, in terms of number of visits, time to reconstruction, time off of work, kind of all those things that radically impact patient lives. but those aren't questions that are getting support from our clinician members of the guideline panel because they're not interested in that. They wanna look at a technique question. Um, so for us, it's very much going to be a, how do we create the right mindset? Um, you know, Are we going to continue to create guidelines that are for, for clinicians that do not address those questions that the patient find most important. And so I, I mean, I'm interested to hear the discussion. This barrier for us is enormous. This is very helpful, um, Lauren, that you mentioned that. And after answering your, or, or commenting on, on, on your um, um, idea, I also um, pick up the ideas that are there in the in the chat. But you, you were just asking, for whom do we create the guidelines? And I have an experience that was quite helpful when we start a new guideline or if we start the update of a, of a guideline and we have the kickoff meeting. What we do with the guideline group is asking them, why do you sit here and what are your goals with this guideline? What do you want to achieve? And this is quite an, an, an open discussion for all the guidelines that we have and for all the guideline groups. And what comes up Every time, and I think this is really astonishing, is not that they say we need the latest, um, uh, very, very expensive medication or an, a, another um, procedure or whatever, but what they say is we need understanding for patients what the um, 
what the condition is about. We, we have a problem with adherence. We have a problem of communication. And they come up with a lot of these issues and saying this is the most important um, gaps in, in um, healthcare that we are facing. It's, it's more about communication. It's about understanding of the, um, of the process and, and of the therapies and of the diagnosis. And so, so nearly everything they mentioned is about communication. And so it is quite easy for us to, to um, intervene there and say, okay, what we can offer you is that we highlight these recommendations where you think communication is key. And then we can offer tools to enable this kind of communication. Um, however, <laughs> that's a bit like, sometimes it goes a bit like in, in, in your direction. When you ask them, where do you think that communication is key? It's about like comparing techniques. You know, so it's uh, again a bit there where, where you said, but um, if you have a guideline developing team that itself is committed to the idea of shared decision making, you can use this um, impulse that is coming from the group to to um, to offer them um, decision aids and offer them to integrate them into the guideline. But um, and and next level is um, the way how you present the guideline either online or as a PDF document. What we provide is, uh, what we do is that we provide all the decision aids that we have together with the guideline so that the clinicians see them and are made aware of either on a website or in the PDF document. So these are some thim simple ideas, but um, we also know that the uptake of these decision aids is varying strongly between GPs who definitely like them and use them a lot and um, other specialists that do not care that much about the decision aids that we offer. So yes, however, that, that is an issue. And maybe I think in our toolkit chapter, we say that integrating shared decision-making into guidelines needs strategic planning from the very beginning. And I think discussing the issue with a group saying, hi, this is what we are making the guideline for. The guideline is to support individual decision-making. And so we offer tools that go along with individual decision-making. This is very helpful. Um, if you have any further comments on that issue, please do not hesitate to, to speak up. However, there has been another very interesting and important discussion in the chat about the idea of offering, um, changing the word of, of wording of recommendation, saying you offer something because that is, and this is exactly what I meant with guidelines being a barrier. This is contradictory to the idea of performance measures. If you offer something, you cannot measure whether it is definitely done. And then it is very difficult to understand whether the healthcare you provide is adequate or not. Um, so yes, there, there is definitely an issue with the um, the idea of um, quality assurance on a population level and individual shared decision making and individual care that is appropriate on the um, on on the micro level. And Mary just suggested that you would need quality indicators, performance measures for shared decision making. And we're definitely discussing this in Germany with some of our guidelines and how we could develop these. Um, we have an institute that has been started to, that has started to develop um, um, performance measures based on uh, patient reported outcome and experience measures. That's a difficult task and I'm not sure whether that really will work, but um, however, developing a um, performance measure on how was the process of decision making and to, to, to understand whether or not the care that was provided was in accordance with the idea of shared decision making. This is a very interesting issue. And Mary, you just said that you, you believe it's possible to um, offer shared decision making at the offer mentioned above. Um, have you... Concrete suggestions, how the process could be measured. So have you started some research into that or um, what was what would be would be your idea for a, a performance measure about on, on shared decision making? Okay, so research is going on. 
Yeah, but I think this would be very important to share. Um, more to come. Yeah, great. Looking, I'm I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> definitely, very good idea because it's definitely this this um, issue that you just um, described. Um, that once you have a performance measure, and if this performance measure is even like pay for performance, that's um, which is combined to that, then the incentive not to discuss the options, but to do that, what is measured is difficult. And this is the kind of um, frame in, in which guidelines definitely can be a barrier to shared decision-making. One example, we had a um, performance measure for um, um, colorectal cancer screening. And here it's a very preference sensitive decision, however, because there can be substantial harms although be benefits can also be very substantial. However, we think it's very preference sensitive, but the, the performance measure was about measuring how many procedures were performed. And so this is completely counterproductive for shared decision-making. So it's very a, a very good example. Um, yes, other ideas from the group, how to create the right mindset. What I said, and I think, um, Mary supported that in, in the chat as well, mm -hmm. is definitely um, starting the strategic planning of integration of shared decision-making from the very beginning and to discuss this with the group. Because it doesn't work if you just do it on top and like against the will of the group. Have any others here in this workshop experience, have you discussed some of these aspects with guideline panels? Um, I'm happy if someone speaks up. If not, I will just uh, re report on a little research that has been done by the Cochrane team that has done the review on shared decision, no, on, on, on decision aid, sorry. Uh, Don Stacy and, and colleagues have um, issued this wonderful Cochrane review in 2017, where they reviewed all the studies on decision aids and whether they helped or not. And of course they found they were effective, but what they did next was they, um, they went back to all the authors of the studies that had um, developed decision aids that had been uh, tested in robust um, trials and that had definitely um, encouraging effects. And they uh, asked them, "Did you use? Do, do you use these decision aids? And are they implemented?" And most of the authors that responded said no, um, because a, they had a lack of funding, which is always a problem. They, they, they couldn't update the decision aids. And another very important reason was that they said, well, we have this nice decision aid and it has been proven to be effective in a nice trial, but our clinicians think it doesn't work because it's not fit for any clinical situation or whatever. So um, what they suggest is that if, once you develop decision aids, you always do it together with clinicians that are to use them in the clinical encounter. So this is why we think it is key that you discuss all these strategies around shared decision-making with the guideline group um, when you start. And that you um, let all the guideline group review the decision aids that you develop in, um, under the aspects of um, usability, acceptance in clinical situations. Uh, so this is definitely a very important recommendation that we would make for the development of guideline-based decision tools, that they are always developed together with the guideline group, reviewed by the guideline group, and tested not only with patients, but with clinicians. Um, another recommendation. Um, all right. Any other ideas how to create the right mindset? You are guideline, most of you said they were guideline developers or somehow linked to guideline development. If you were to um, introduce this idea of um, incorporating aspects of shared decision-making to your next guideline panel, what kind of support would you need? Would you want Gen Public or would you like the Guidelines International Network to offer some advice to offer some more concrete um, like handbooks or so or a position paper or whatever so that, that that supports the idea or any other tools that might be helpful 
Who has an idea? Videos, yeah, video, <laughs> videos, right? Um, Janice, you're thinking about like um, decision aids that are visualized in like a discussion between a patient and a, and a, um, a doctor and uh, where the... Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting. Yeah, I'm thinking that also, it could even be two doctors or clinicians discussing the guideline where mm -hmm. there might be nuances that are controversial or hard to understand where they're actually teaching each other, right? So I just bring that up because YouTube has recognized, um, you know, the issues of misinformation. So they've come together with, I think the who's involved in National Sciences of Medicine, NQF, um, Center for Medi you know, Medical Society, many groups, and they're um, going to be developing short videos, you know, because everybody's attention span is short. Uh, and I'm working on, you know, just specific issues, uh, not framing it, I think, in misinformation, but informative videos, which is really neat. So, um, yeah, anyway, and I think it could be very beneficial. We're just living in that world. And I think there's opportunities for both. Yes, that's a very good point, Janice, because, yeah, that um, it's also about like a personalization of, of um um, a more theoretical idea of shared decision making if you see two people discussing options and you, you are able to listen to them. However, I think it's great you you brought this up because um, most of the guideline groups I know are even lacking the expertise to, to set up a patient information and do this in a simple language. And I think doing videos is even more complicated and would need more resources and funding um has any one of you this is very interesting has any one of you experience with doing any kind of videos for guidelines one is shared decision making situations might be an issue i've also seen guideline groups that were looking for someone supporting them to to, to convey the most important messages of the guideline through videos and the very few videos i've seen were quite poorly done and not at all funny to look at so i'm wondering has any one of you experience working with professional teams? Lauren? I think we are very much still on the let's tackle infographics and visual abstracts and more visual presentations. We're nowhere near being in a place to start thinking about videos. So I don't know where everyone else is, but that's that's light years from now. <laughs> Yeah, but I think visual abstracts also are very, very helpful. We we had a plenary session on that in the uh, um, in, in the last gen conference, and uh, I think it's really helpful to understand what the most important guideline recommendations are about. And if you have the right presentation of harms and benefits, it at least enables somehow um, risk communication given that you discuss the different options. Right, I think one aspect I see in the chat here from, from Mary again is saying, perhaps a way to encourage uh, guidelines to include support for shared decision-making is to add this to the standards of guideline trustworthiness. I understand that such standards become the catalyst for guideline program staff to seek and acquire additional, additional funds from program leaders. And this is a very good thing because um, this is something that GIN definitely could be committed to um, because we have the GIN standards for guidelines. And this is a very helpful idea that we will bring forward to the GIN board to consider whether or not this might be another standard for, um, for the GIN paper. And maybe this also needs an updating after 10 years it's out right now, I think it's from 2012. So this is a good thing um and uh sandy and lauren say it's an interesting idea so yes definitely it's about setting standards and maybe um um, uh, um elevating standards so that um the standards that we had would need to be reviewed and would need to be a bit straightened and strengthened in the uh, in the way of in the direction of shared decision making 
So this is a very good point. Um, and you said, um, Janice, you said the gin public checklist needs some updating. Could you yeah, be more? Yeah, yeah, evidently they're working on it, but um, because I was interviewed, uh, because I put out a recent just small video that came to my attention, I realized, wow, um, a lot of people haven't worked with public on guidelines and it's along that line, right? So when I went into the checklist, I just saw so many opportunities. They have feedback at the end of each checklist, which is, you know, a long list. And so the individual said, oh, you should, you should, you know, respond, but it would be so many emails, but I am going to respond to some of the key ones. But when we're talking about involvement, I just think that, you know, even maybe for the next gen conference, for if somebody would like to come up with a video, because you can do it yourself now on your phone, you know, uh, there's a group in Australia that is doing this, <clears throat> physicians, patient, it's called PPAA, on, you can see it on LinkedIn. But they're developing individuals themselves are making um, uh, videos and in different areas, right? And and for patients might be doing it, carers and or you know a lot number of clinicians, researchers on certain subjects. Every uh, end of every month, they collect these videos, couple of minute videos. But I think that in truth, uh, when we're talking about patients, we want to see a difference in shared decision making. The point I'm trying to get across is there's a huge divide between evidence in clinical decision supports right or you know whatever it, you know shared decision making and i see that I, I i like using the term informed shared decision making as a patient i i feel that's very important that i'm informed of my you know options but i think that um a lot of it a lot of the research i've seen done on all this has to do with the presentation how you present the shared decision making or the evidence right so that's where I, you know, we could be light years away from a video, but the truth is we could think about, you know, putting one forward and, you know, for the next gen conference, even developing something as an example of what could be done. Right. And um, just ourselves that that doesn't take that much time. I think we, you know, put a lot into it in viz abstracts. I just think that this is, if we want, you know, compliance or adherence or whatever we want to call when patients uh, need a little bit of nudging, I think that videos can be very, in, you know, or vis abstracts can help a lot. It was all over the place, but I recommend people look at the gin public checklist and provide insights because evidently they're working on updating them now. Right, thank you, Janice. Um, yeah, so um, might be a good idea to just start a video and I will bring back this idea, Janice, to our next gin public meeting and see what we can do because we might collaborate with NICE who have a very um, very fit communications team. And I will ask Jane um, Cow, who is the actual chair of NICE, whether that would be possible. And we de definitely love to contact you on that. Another sure, important I'd, issue, sorry. I'd help to work on it. I don't necessarily need to be in it, but I think, I think it would be fun, right? It could yeah. just be, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good idea. Thank you. That's really great. Another issue in the chat is the linkage between uh, shared decision making and patient safety. Is that an issue or not? And what I find striking here, I'm Mary, this what you wrote in the chat that um, uh, when patients are involved in choice, isn't care safer? Does this um, tactic help create the right mindset? Um, and Sandy, you just asked. Um, that you or you 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 wrote that you suspect that you um, patients engage in shared decision making would be more compliant about taking their medicine consistently and correctly, and this is what research in some ways has found that uh, patients are more um, convinced of the decisions that they have made. There is less decision or decisional regret after using decision aids. And um, that the um, that the time that the physician or the healthcare professional spends with discussion on how the treatment works and reminders on 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 what you have to do and how to take your medicines that all this time is much shorter when you have um, chosen your therapy through a shared decision making process. So it costs a bit more time in the beginning, but it spares a lot of time in, in the end. So there is a lot of research about the effects of shared decision-making out there. But 
I have been aware that this is not very well known in the guideline community. So do you think that we need a straighter link between shared decision making research and guideline research? Um, Mary, you just said that uh, at HRQ, you say that the relationship between shared decision making and health outcomes is loose, not tight at all. It's hard to, to show any effects on health outcomes, on heart outcomes, because due to individual situations, patients might make an informed decision for an option that does not improve your health outcome, but is fits more in your daily um, living as less treatment burden and so on. So it's very hard to measure the effect of shared decision-making on heart health outcomes. But this is why the most important outcomes that are um, evaluated with shared decision-making are more like decisional conflicts or more like quality of life um, and um, acceptance and knowledge and all these things, which are quite soft outcomes, which is tricky. Um, Janice, you were asking, is that more dissemination and implementation research correlation between guidelines and shared decision-making? Um, not, not sure whether, um, whether this research correlates, and, but, but it should inform at least guideline development. So that maybe, or that's a question that I'm asking you, do you think it is helpful for guideline development groups, if you could just show that shared decision making has important influences on um, health outcomes, on on not really sorry, not not health out outcomes, but on the management of care, on behavior, on adherence, and all these issues. Do you think this is helpful to know? I think and it's implied. Think I think it's implied when we develop guidelines. Right? It's implied that it will be. Don't you? But I don't think it's explicitly called out. Yes, then the, that's right. And it's not very well known. However, there, there is enough evidence. And an issue that we see very often is that we when, when we do our systematic searches, we always touch the aspect of shared decision making for the specific conditions. And the most evidence that there is out there um, is for the use of decision aids, which is an intervention that is more easily to be tested because you have a defined intervention. Shared decision-making with all its processes is more difficult to, to standardize. Um, however, there are also, um, there, there is evidence on the use of shared decision-making as well a, as a process, which we try to describe. Um, and we have started to, to underpin all the recommendations that we do in favor of shared decision making with all this, um, with all the evidence that is out there. So do you think that that would be helpful, for example, if Jin would provide a kind of standardized text or, or um, a, um, resource of, um, of evidence for the use of decision aids and shared decision making and some, let's say, um, text blocks that could be used for guidelines? Would that be helpful or? Um... Okay, no answer here. I'll discuss that with our colleagues. <laughs> Um, next issue. Um, we have been discussed. We have been discussing shared decision making and the development of decision aids at the last Gen conference in Toronto. And we had a workshop there. And um, what I've learned there is that some of the participants there said that they thought it would be helpful to learn about decision aids that are already out there that are based on guidelines, because not all guideline developers have the resources to develop their own decision aids. And um, the idea was to create a kind of database for guideline-based decision aids. There is a database for decision aids in Canada. Uh, I don't think it's updated regularly right now, or at least there are some decision aids in there that are quite outdated. But however, there is an important repository that one could build upon. And uh, what Jin, for example, could do is ask the members to provide their decision aids once they have developed them for the guidelines. One could offer kind of translation services or so. So the question is, 
do you think that would encourage guideline developers if we would offer this kind of toolkit for um, guideline developers saying, look, here are five decision aids on uh, ICDs for heart failure or, um, I don't know, um, psychotherapy or antidepressants for major depression or whatever? Um, do you think that would encourage your guideline groups to use decision aids or to recommend decision aids? I'm not sure it would change um, people's commitment to doing them or creating them, but I know I, I would love that um, at, as an organization that's kind of decided we want to explore creating them. Um, we have no place to start. So, so having, uh, so essentially if this already exists, it will be fantastically helpful for me. Otherwise I'm gonna have to do all the legwork of trying to track things down. Um, and kind of, you know, creating my own, um, my own database of a range of different types of decision aids and kind of identifying strengths and weaknesses and things that might be considered entry level shared decision making tools versus like really, I think one of the things that is very intimidating that I saw a lot at GIN is, um, presenting these really outstanding products that required enormous quantities of resources. Um, yes, in some ways they're very inspirational, but in other ways I think they're discouraging because I, you know, I'm looking at those going, okay, it's just me, I'm the only staff member. I need an entry level decision aid model, um, you know, just to start moving into that space and, and having these aspirational um, tools are amazing, but also having a little bit more scaffolding for how you get there, what's a decent starting place um, would be really helpful as well. So I would say it would be amazing to have that as a resource, but also to include, um, you know, things other than the gold standard in, in decision aids and shared decision making products, because we have to start somewhere. I think this is so important what you say. Of course, we always present present the the examples that we are proud of and where we think something worked very well. Um, I think this is inherent to nearly everyone doing a presentation. <laughs> but however, we with our quite adequately stuffed um, organizations, we are facing challenges as well. And so, um, it is very important that you say that we do not only offer these examples that are like intimidating. For me, it's always when I have a look at the nice guidelines and all the work they're doing, I say, oh my, how can they, <laughs> how can they and what can we do to, to reach um, a, a level that's comparable? Um, however, um, that we offer all the, the, the efforts that we have made and that we provide all the products that we have developed in, in these guidelines in, and shared decision-making communities. I think that might be helpful, but also, and that's definitely, Lauren, something I would like to ask you, um, how, how do we do this in a way that does not have the opposite effect, that has no backfire effect, like saying, oh, it's so complicated, better not use anything. What would be the best way for you? What would be, what would rise acceptability? Lauren, any further idea? I, I'm, I'm thinking, you can't see my wheels spinning, but they're spinning. <laughs> um, I, I really feel like this is a top-down decision that the organizations really have to be committed to, um, you know, thinking about patient-facing products. And if your organization is just not interested in products that are, you know, intended to help patients at least as much as the clinicians, uh, I, I think it's going to be an uphill battle. So to some extent, I think um, there's not much gen public can do to increase buy-in. That buy-in has to be there from at least somebody within the organization. Um, but then if there is some interest or some buy-in, then I do think having a robust set of examples um, is very helpful. I also think what you were talking about, about um, maybe not exactly a bibliography, but but more um, 
more of a how can shared decision making tools, you know, improve performance kind of I don't know, position statements, but just really pull together some of that research that you're talking about, about how decision aids can be helpful um, without having to read, you know, a several hundred page Cochrane review or something like that. Um, even a short list bibliography with some bullet points that said, you know, here are some ways that shared decision making tools really improve outcomes and patient satisfaction. Here's a list for further reading. I do think those things can tip the balance. Um, but I think there has to be that buy-in initially from someone. Yes, that's an important point, Lauren. Thank you. And I think um, maybe the what I think was Mary suggested that we um, expand the standards for guideline development might help to create this kind of buy-in because there is kind of lacking of understanding that one of the goals of guidelines should also be to support individual decision making. So I think this is a very important point that you uh, came up with and that I'll definitely um, bring up to the gym board and the question whether we could include an aspect of shared decision making um, in the gin standards. And Mary, you come up with something that's, um, I think Sandy has discussed in the very beginning where you said um, the um, discussion whether uh, the patient-centered care whether uh, versus population level care and shared decision making is a little bit goes a little bit in the same direction it's about individualization of of guideline recommendations um and it enables um healthcare um, um professional and, and and patient to discuss options against an individual background however um Evidence shows that it becomes more and more complicated to to do guideline. Uh, to, sorry, to do population level um, recommendations because the subgroups get smaller and smaller. So what you would need for decision aids basically is um, that you um, before you start the decision process, you would need to ask for some individual factors that would. Um, um, narrow the pathway and um, suggest only those options that are suitable for you. We have had an example here in Germany for a um, decision aid on first treatment for prostate cancer that was developed by the German um, Association of Urology. And what they did is that they gave a kind of individual lock-in to each patient. And they could first uh, provide all their data about age and comorbidities and cancer-specific issues like um, grading and tumor stage and whatever. They could um, enter all this in, into a database and then they were offered the, the options that were recommended for them. And then they could start um, the shared decision-making process with their physician. And I think update, uptake for this specific decision aid is quite large. It's not, uh, given the large number of patients that there are e each year, it's not it's not enormous. But however, I think it's more like two or 3,000 patients a year using this kind of decision support. So that might be an idea. An experience that we have with a lot of decision aids is that it becomes more and more complicated um, to provide the options. For example, that short decision aid that I offered for a stance and bypass um, is not that easy. We, it, when, when we first issued that in 2014, we said bypass has a prognostic um, um, benefit and stand stoned. However, um, in, in, in between the two, 2014 and the, the actual guideline um, release, there has been quite some research been done about subgroup analyses, and now it's discussing whether you have diabetes, whether you have a multivessel disease, whether you have a um, left main stenosis, whether you have um, yeah um, complex or, or or not so complex um, um, disease, and all these issues have to be taken in mind and and have to be considered when making a decision and. 
So we need to tailor the decision aids more specifically to different clinical situations. I think this is helpful for the clinician. It's a lot of work for the guideline developer or for the developer of the decision aid. Um, and Sandy, you just said the ultimate goal needs to be a more personal level of what will work for individual patients with all the complexities. That's right. And this is what I was just talking about. <laughs> However, um, the, um, the problem you're um, addressing here with network meta-analysis is, however, it's, it's all also tricky because this is on another, this is on the level of trials that you're trying to get evidence from comparing as many trials as possible. However, what is also very important is that you take in mind the, and what this is what physicians very often forget is that you take in mind the individual factors that um, are important for a person like um, the, the contextual factors according to the ICF. I don't know if you're um, familiar with that. It's just asking how do you live and where do you live and what are your um, convictions and how many social contacts do you have and what are your beliefs, what is your faith, um, what is your relationship to a family, to, to, to your, your um, relatives, to your friends and so on. Um, but also um, what what is with your work, um, what are the conditions you're living in, because all this has influence on how you're able to, to um, adhere to a certain therapy. Um, a therapy might have influence on your daily living, and all these things are not taken um, into account when making this, this kind of clinical decisions. This is what Victor Montari and his idea of minimally disruptive care is about. And um, though this has been issued in, I think, 2009, I have seen hardly any attempts to integrate this idea into guidelines. And I think this is key for shared decision making. It's not only comparing options and having, having ideas and, and, and preferences, but it's also about the impact that any kind of therapy or, or diagnosis has on your daily life and how you can cope with that. And this is also lacking. Um, yeah, but how can, Sandy, how can guidelines support this idea of individualized care and offering um, the opportunity to make individual decisions as precisely as possible? It is, I think, about subgroup analysis that we try to do and try to find out what works for whom. However, the evidence gets poorer, the smaller the subgroups are. So what are your suggestions on that? What could garland developers do and what could maybe Jim offer to support this idea? Yeah, so that's that's actually, of course, the uh, the main challenge. <clears throat> what uh, what has to be done, you're right, is much better uh, evidence capture. And and Victor Montori's point is is very well made. I'm not sure you'll be able to address all of that in clinical trials, but what you might be able to address in clinical trials are physiological reactions and groups with various, um, you know, constellations of co-occurring um, more comorbidities could have, um, you know, different responses to different options. This only works when you have a, uh, a, a, a set of interventions so that you have options, right? It's not just like, you know, a new, a newly evolving class of drugs, right? But you have several, or you have different classes of drugs you're comparing. And, and B, you have to have robust enough evidence to be able to talk about each of those groups in a quantity that will su support meaningful analyses. So you can't today do much of that. Of course, that doesn't mean we can't push for it for the future, right? Aim for it and support it. But a lot of the social determinants of health and other uh, concepts that are what makes each individual so, so unique will never be part of, I just can't see that ever being part of these analyses, these methodological analyses. And that's where shared decision-making comes down to, let's talk about you, 
let's talk about me. Let's talk about the individual patient, not a, a population or a subpopulation, but an individual patient. And so it's a combination of what can we um, do to support research and uh, analyses of the data and then guidelines uh, that are more targeted, but then still, we need to build out our ability to have meaningful shared decision making for each individual individual with all of those complexities included. Right. And do you think, Sandy, that um, once guidelines make statements about um, benefits and harms of interventions, that they should definitely do as many subgroup considerations as possible and provide them? Uh, so you have these one groups where you might think an effect could be even more clear and others where you would be sure that you wouldn't see a kind of effect. The problem is yeah. that, yeah, because uh, what, what we see very often, and that is also not sure, but I, I think it's also an effect that the, the grade system has is that people try to meta analyze as much as possible and then the, the the information though not that valid about different subgroups gets a little bit lost so um yeah um that might be an important aspect as well mm -hmm. um, yeah totally but also i think primary care physicians need a certain level of training in how to do um shared decision making in a more meaningful more more um uh, relevant way not that they have any more time by the way that's a real pro challenge they're being asked to do more in less time but i think maybe there could be i think we should take this back to the american college of physicians hint hint um <laughs> but maybe there could be training sessions for primary care physicians to um to uh learn better ways of of doing this uh, you had asked earlier about videos, and I didn't mention this at the time, but when I was at the American College of Chess Physicians and we were doing some smoking cessation work, we did um, videos of, um, what do you call them, a standardized patient or something? You know, the, the people who play role play patients in training physicians and the... Um, this was a really skilled person. She played the role of a smoker. And, um, you know, we did these various encounters with different um, physicians, some who were very much trained in how to address uh, smoking cessation with patients and others who weren't. And you could, you could totally see how important that training was. But, um, I just think physicians need need to understand the value of this and maybe be supported in how to do a better job of shared decision making at the primary care level. Yes, that's another great idea that you just brought up and I think five minutes to go, so I'll definitely try a little wrap up. Um, I think there are trainings um, for shared decision making, but maybe not so well known to the guideline community. That would be an opportunity for collaboration, like, for example, with the International Shared Decision-Making Society that we could at least try to link to um, and raise awareness of the um, of, of these videos that they are. Um, thank you, Mary, for um, participating and contributing so much. I'll just like to do a very short wrap up and then thank you all for the great input that you have. Um, I think we, you came up with different ideas. One was, why do we not think about like performance measures for shared decision-making and integrating them, them into care? And Mary, you, are, you, you said that you are um, doing research on that and we'd be very, very curious to learn about that more, but that would be a great idea. You suggested that Gen Public might do a video on uh, guideline development and how to... Um, how to integrate shared decision-making aspects into that. And this is a very concrete um, task that I will bring back to the gym public working group. Um, Sandy, you just mentioned that 
um, many physicians are not aware of um, training opportunities that there might be for shared decision making. And that could be a task for Jin, for example, to um, provide links to this kind of training or even think about developing a training specifically for a different um, um, physician or healthcare professional groups. And uh, check out what already is there, and link to to others that are active in that field. You suggested a repository for um, for decision aids that we could work on in the um, in Gen public and in Gen. And a very very helpful suggestion that I will definitely bring forward is that we have a look at the Gen standards, whether or not they could be um, expanded and the idea of shared decision-making be integrated into these standards. So these were great ideas and great suggestions that you all came up with. And thank you so much for this discussion that we had. I understand that it has been technically challenging for one or the other of you who was not able to speak out because maybe due to background noise or the setting you're in, but thank you so much for participating today. Um, thank you so much for those who either contributed in the chat or uh, were able to speak up here for your um, great ideas that you offered. And um, yeah, for the ideas that you um, gave me that I will forward to the GIN Public Working Group and to the GIN Board. And hopefully um, some good things come out of the discussion that we have today. And I'm um, grateful for all the kind of support that you have offered today and who's willing to support Jane Public further. I'm happy if you contact us, either me or Jane Cole or um, Karen Graham or the Jin office. So thank you for your time today. Um, thank you for your participation. And I hope you will enjoy the day or the evening or whatever. See you, hopefully at the gym conference next year. Thank you so much and bye everyone.